Welcome to episode 155 of Clarity Compressed. My name is Paul J. Daly. I will be your host. And today we're talking to the man who can teach your kids the same way he teaches Elon Musk's kids. We're making our way through the fog of life and clarity is understanding where we are on the map. You are here. <laughs> Let the good times roll. This is Clarity Compressed. All right, this is a really unique episode, and I'm so happy to share this with you. Today, my guest is Chrisman Frank, the co-founder of an education platform called Synthesis, and synthesis.is. And basically speaking, this is a class that comes out of Elon Musk's school, Ad Astra, which actually takes place on the campus of SpaceX. And it really got started because Elon wanted a way to teach his kids and teach them in the way he thought was most effective to teach them. So as you can imagine, it is holistic. It is out of the box, but it makes a lot of sense when you listen to it. Now, I homeschool my kids and um, I've been, had the pleasure and opportunity to do that. I know everyone can't do that. But one thing that I've, I've come, in, come to terms with really quickly is that kids are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. And kids are actually able to handle a lot more then we give them credit for. And sometimes they don't get that opportunity inside a more structured, rigid system. And so we talk about the education system. We're going to talk about um, how kids actually think and how giving them more challenges and more complexity actually is good for them and they handle it well. And if we're going to solve a lot of the problems that uh, we have right now or that we've even created for ourselves in the last 24 months, in the last decade or two, well, then we're going to need this next generation to think outside the box, to be able to manage chaos, to be able to think holistically around problems, relate to one another in a way where they can work together to solve a problem instead of being at odds or in a little bubble by themselves to just solve arithmetic problems. So a little outside the box episode, but I think you're really going to enjoy it. Very insightful. Um, going to welcome to the program. Can't wait for you to meet Mr. Crispin Frank. So Crispin, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Thanks for giving us some of your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right. So we're just get right into it. You teach kids in a way that is really unconventional and like started with Elon Musk and SpaceX and people in person. And now it's, you know, now it's virtual and it's got this whole big allure around it. Can you just give us the summary of like how this came to be and what it is? Yeah, yeah. So the the company is called Synthesis, and it's named after uh, it's named after the most popular class at uh, at the school, the lab school that Elon Musk created for his own kids at uh, at SpaceX. Um, the way the way I got involved is I went I went down there and I met with uh, I met with the director of the school, the co creator of the school, is a teacher named uh, Josh Don, and uh, I just I fell in love with what they were doing at the school, and I just thought like I really had to have this you know, for my kids, I just, I got, I like, I love the school. The kids were so like kind of joyous about, uh, about what they were learning. And it also seemed like what they were doing was very, very complex. And they had these just incredible communication skills. And I just felt like if I didn't get my kids this kind of experience, you know, they were, they were going to, going to fall behind or they're going to be at a disadvantage. And, uh, yeah, I think every parent can relate to that somewhat, just feeling like I'm not doing enough for my kids. And uh, the school was only for like Elon's kids and a handful of the other, you know, SpaceX families. So if, if you weren't like a rocket engineer, there's kind of like no chance of getting in there. Um, Literally the I, children of rocket scientists. Yeah. <laughs> only. Yeah. That's, that's right. I mean, even, <laughs> even amongst the, you know, Elon will call them rocket engineers, right? Cause they're not, they're not really scientists. Yeah, right, right. But, but even amongst that pretty select group, uh, it, was, it was still the school was not, you know, it was like a one in 10 or one in 20 chance of getting in, even if you were at SpaceX, it was just like yeah. a really, you know, it's like the world's like most exclusive school. <laughs> um, so I was lucky enough to get to go down there. I met Josh. Uh, he was just, um, you know, just this incredibly intense guy, like kind of maybe like what you would expect from, you know, the teacher that Elon hired to teach his own kids. Imagine answering um, to Elon. Yeah, I, I was just, <laughs> I was just connected with uh with uh, Sam Teller, who was Elon's chief of staff at the uh, at the time they started the school, that was like his first assignment. So Sam worked across like 
boring company, Tesla, SpaceX, Neuralink, like all these things. As soon as he joined, Elon was like, we're trying to start a school, like get with, get with this guy, Josh, and like help, help figure it out. So I was asking him, like, was Josh always like this? Was because he was, he this or, like, or, did, or did you do this to him? Right? Yeah. Like, like what, what's <laughs> happening? And he was like, ah, he was always like pretty intense, but definitely kind of got ramped up when you're, you know, reporting to, to Elon. Um, that's yeah. uh, that, that'll do that to people. I think so. Um, yeah, so the story of how the school came about was Elon had his kids in normal schools, you know, like, like not, I mean, they're very fancy, like private schools, but yeah. what he realized, I think, is they basically kind of do the same thing. No matter how fancy the school is, they're all kind of based on the same model. And I think he looked at that and was like, this is, you know, I don't know what they're doing, but this is not, these aren't the skills that like we need at SpaceX to build, you know, rockets so we can build a Mars colony or at Tesla so we can build like this, this is not doing it. And so pull them out. Let's start our own school. The big thing when he, Elon always talks about first principles, not doing the age segregation thing. I mean, you know, if you're a homeschooling parent like that, the age segregation is one of the just craziest things imaginable, just kind of treating kids like they're, they're like their birth date is the most important thing. about. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's really a pretty, a pretty recent invention. Yeah, it's, it's historically anomalous for sure. I mean, if you look at definitely like, the, the way that this stuff should go is you learn, you know, when you have multiple kids, you realize this, they learn from someone who's like a little bit ahead of them. Right. So someone who's just a little bit ahead, then they start, they learn what they learn what that person knows. And yep. there should be kind of like an unbroken chain basically where you have your, you know, kind of elders in the society and the, you know, people who are a little bit younger kind of looking up to them to, as a guide mm -hmm. and it should go all the way down basically mm -hmm. to, to birth. And what that age segregation thing does, it, it cuts you off and, puts you in like a world of only of your peers. There's nobody to learn from and there's nobody for you to teach. So I think it creates like a kind of, you know, uh, kind of like anxiety. And, um, and yeah, I think that's like one, of, you know, if I could snap my fingers and fix one thing about education, it would definitely be that. So Elon recognized that uh, the school they had was just, it was seven to 14 year olds, no, no grade levels. Right. So they had that thing where the kids are able to help those who are who are a little younger and able to learn from those who are older. Mm -hmm. The other one that Elon talks about is uh, the criticism of school being tool focused. So in school, you just, you learn, you learn tools, right? They teach you math, like uh, separated from context. Mm -hmm. And I remember that being like really difficult for me. Like I, I'm not really able to learn things out of context like that. I kind of need like the problem. And once, once I have the problem, then I can learn the tools. And Elon thought that's basically the way most people are. I think he's right about that. So wanted to create a school that was problem focused and not tool focused. If that makes sense. It, it totally does. So he creates this school, um, you know, Josh Spear heads this um, and all of a sudden you have this ecosystem kind of real exclusive within SpaceX space that the children, some of the engineers, Elon's kids are in there. Um, and apparently they're doing really well. And you went and you go see, and you said, I need this for my kids. Uh, how many kids do you have? What's your family? Tell us about your family. Uh, I've, so at the time it was just my uh, oldest son is about two. So he's almost seven and I have a four and a half and uh, and a one and a half year old girl. So, to, yeah, so you're right in it, right girl. in the thick of it. But coming back. So you saw this, you know, you're like, I have to be a part of this. How did synthesis like is the most popular class or the one that was really great at the school? And and what happened from there? Like how how did we get to where we are now? Yeah. So I when I went to visit the school, I um. You know, there's lots of stuff they're doing that's really cool there, but a lot of it was, you know, not really like scalable, right? So, for mm -hmm. example, their bio, their science teacher is, uh, you know, been involved in like the founding of like a biotech company. She's a PhD from Caltech, and she's amazing with kids. So it's a total like unicorn kind of person. And oh, like yeah. all the teachers are really, they're really like that. So that's like not really, not really going to scale. Um, but but I was looking, I was went down there to kind of look for things that that would scale. And, um, and we just kind of, I was like observing the classroom, like watching what happened. And then it was lunch slash recess. And there were a bunch of, we were sitting around talking with the teachers and there were some kids that were still inside kind of like sitting around a table and like shouting at each other. <laughs> and I was like, what is, what is going on in there? Like, that seems like where the action is. And one of the teachers was like, oh, that's synthesis. Like the kids get kind of obsessed with synthesis. And I was like, what is that? Like, that's part of your school. Cause I've never seen kids, you know, be that enthused about something they're doing. And then you look at it and it's like, I couldn't even make sense of it. And these are like, you know, 11, 12 year old kids. It just, it was like, 
I'm just seeing what like, is, two they cobbles. seem like they know something's going on, but there was it wasn't even it wasn't easy to tell what exactly is going on from the exactly. Outside. And it, it's it still was like Josh would try to explain it to me over the coming months, and I like I kind of got that it was like games, like it was they Josh was creating these. This is just how crazy Josh is, but he had 30 kids and he was like spending his weekends like making up these games that would uh you know like get the kids to kind of use what they'd been learning in the school and like you have to use teamwork to solve these complex problems and and build their communication skills and that kind of thing and he was just he was making these games up for like one-offs for these kids to use like during the school like that's that's just like what he spends his time doing he's it's like he's, that scene in inception have you ever seen inception yeah the movie when when he he's like okay draw me a maze it'll take me 60 seconds to solve Right. Like, uh, so that's what he's doing. He's drawing mazes that'll take them a certain amount of time to solve under certain criteria. Yeah, pretty much. And I, you know, I never really seen anything like that. And I just thought like, this is, you know, this seems really exciting. It, it, Elon had talked about the observation that his, he did not need to encourage his kids to play video games. Like you have to pry them out of their hands. Every and parent so, is nodding their head. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And so like, wouldn't it be great if you could make, you know, learning like a game. And I think that's been gamification is kind of a word I don't like, because I think that's been sort of abused. Like you just, you can't like really graft game mechanics onto something like subject matter. That's boring. right. Just by putting a score at the end. Right. Yeah, it's exactly. Not, and that's, that's mostly what it. it, what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, is, but you know, synthesis is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. The games are engaging, on their own right to the to where like i remember we ran we ran the beta cohorts i interviewed some of the kids afterward and i was like my big worry at the time was like that we were kind of competing with like call of duty or other like video games so i was like how would you guys like rate this compared to call of duty and they're like oh it's way better i'm like it's better like how could that possibly be like yeah we, right <laughs> like we spent like two weeks coding this like there's no way you're doing it like as a as a group, right. As, as a team, like it's such a social experience. Cause you're mostly, you're just talking to the other kids and you're solving problems. You get to engage your brain. And jo this, it reminded me of jo something Josh said when I first met him, which is, as I was like, how, how are you getting kids to do this kind of stuff? It seems like very difficult. He was like, kids love complexity. This is the thing that most people don't get. Kids love complexity. The more complexity you throw at them, the more they enjoy it. And like what we do, we make the mistake in school so much of just trying to simplify things down so that they're so simple and so straightforward that anybody wow. can understand it. But they they resonate with the complexity and synthesis like the most complex learning experience because not only we're basically throwing them in these games where they have to figure out how the game works and it's always completely different, right? So it's always like a novel situation with new rules, you know, things that you don't understand. On top of that, you're having to deal with the social complexity which is so critically important. And, and really, you know, the schools, the way they're set up, you, you do your work like on your own, right? Right. Think about in life, you're never doing that. Like even the podcast is like one of the few things that, you know, you, you kind of can almost do it on your own, but, right. but really you can't, there's so many people helping you out. You've, you've got, you know. Yeah, you have technology, editing, hurdles, technology, right. Distribution, right. Exactly. So even things that might seem like at first glance that it's kind of individual work, it ends up being group work. Right. It's, it's the exactly. real world. Exactly. It's exactly. the real world. Everybody, right. Like all the disruption. I mean, just look at this last 12 months, all the disruption that's happened. There's no rule book for it. Everyone's thrown into this, this new situation. We have to make up rules. We have to work together to do it. We have to develop new technologies. We have to find out who's good at what and how they can help us do the next piece, how they can help us do the next piece, identify those, get along right. with one another, and then find a way to monetize it. That's right. <laughs> Sounds and like the real world. As the world keeps changing faster, you know, anything, uh, that's the, the real game. Like we talk about training kids for the meta game, right? Like the idea being you play enough games, you start to, you start to abstract the principles from that. And that's, what's really important because we, the world's changing so fast right now that you can't really, by the time you've trained a kid to play some game really well, the game has changed. Absolutely and so really the core skill right. for the future is like you, you, anything repetitive is going to be automated. Mm -hmm. So the core skill like humans can do, you know, better than, better than machines at this point is, is learn when things change, like adapt to 
adapt to changing rules where there's not enough data to train like a machine learning algorithm to handle that problem, right? Humans are better. We learn with much fewer repetitions than mm -hmm. computers do. Mm -hmm. And so that's what synthesis is about is kind of training kids in that skill so that no matter what games they face in life, they've, they've got the skills to, uh, to figure them out. As I was reading through, um, I don't know if it was the synthesis site. Um, we'll link it up at synthesis.is. Um, I can't remember if it was on the site or somewhere else where I was reading up to prep for this podcast. And uh, Elon said something like, you know, this is this is what we need to do in order, like, you know, to train students so that they can, you know, take on an evil AI or something like that. <laughs> I mean, it sounds ominous, but actually, you know, with his views on AI and, you know, his foresight, it's it's almost like, yeah, maybe this is our best defense against eventually when the AI turns against us. So give us an example of a synthesis game. So you just kind of explain the premise. And yeah. I think like giving us an example of like a sample of what a game has looked like in the past, like what solutions were found, just, just kind of like put it in a boat, put it in a boat for us so that we can yeah, get yeah. our minds around it. There's a, there's the newest game that we've just, just released um, is called art for all. And in that game, students, um, they're always on teams, right? So they're on teams and they're competing with other teams. In this case, your team is trying to put on a, a, an art um, exhibition in different cities around the world. And so you're trying, you're, you're kind of, uh, the, the rules of, of the exhibition are kind of always changing, but basically there's some component of like profitability. So you want to, you need to acquire artworks at auction um, for a reasonable price. And then you put on the exhibition and every city has like kind of a different market for that artwork. So you're trying to get the works of art that are going to be most profitable in the city that you're going to, and you can move around to different cities uh, through the different rounds of the game. Um, so there's the there's a profitability component, and then there's also like a harmony component to your collection. So there's kind of like the critics uh, critics eye view of your collection as well, right? So this, this is the way Josh always designs the games. Like there's always like a couple things going on. So it's it's never you. It's very difficult in advance to kind of work out mathematically how to win the games. It's always like there's there's these kind of things that play against each other. And it's really kind of, you know, you kind of have to experiment to figure out the rules and like figure out the winning strategies sort of by intuition through repeated play. Um, so that's a new one going on. And that one's, that one's really, really awesome because the kids, they love, they love the auction format. Like they're just, <laughs> they're just going nuts. Like what the parents will say is like their kids in another room, they're on the computer and and they just hear just like shouting right and they'll like go in and be like what's what's going on like is every everything all right and the kids are like get out like you know i'm we're, we're working like trying to get out. a van go here yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly and uh it's hilarious to watch the kids because they they'll come up with like what they think a, a certain piece is going to be worth in the market and they'll be like okay it's 20 million so let's bid 20 million on this one and then they'll bid 20 million they go oh no the blue team bid 25 million let's build 26 million. And so they just like completely, they get caught up in the competition. It's like real and, life. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, like, it's going to burn you. It might burn you. I mean, either that's going to be the valuable piece that draws the crowd or you're just totally burnt. Exactly. Exactly. It burns you. So there's interesting kind of strategies with the game where you, you want to, all the kids will bid, bid on like Van Gogh's starry night. Cause it's like, it's pretty and they recognize it and that kind of, but it's usually like not very profitable because right. you, you get into a bidding war. So right. you teach them to like kind of look for undervalued items, right. Or, or items that are going to be more valuable to them because they're in a particular city versus other people. And then this one, it gets more interesting as the kids go because you can, they can start trading the works of art. So you'll have kids who are, they're kind of like acting like, like horse traders. They're going around talking to their teams. Like, you know, you give me this one, I'll throw in 10 million and, and you give me that one. Right. And so that gets like just really interesting and just, you know, much more complex and just, you know, that's much more, you know, you learn about auctions and like theory, you learn about economics, you learn about business and, and yep. you know, it's a, a lot of math you know, in there. Right. Well, yeah. So what we do is they play the games, they get into the games, and then we try to teach them these like mental models or like concepts, right? So we'll teach them concepts from like auctions or like game theory. Um, and they're eager to learn that stuff because it's going to help them win the game, right? Whereas if you go to teach kids about auction theory, like they're probably not going to pay attention. Mental to models are like, yeah, visit me in like psychology 101 when I'm 19 or whatever. Yeah, that stuff is just not interesting. But when you're in the game, kids, they just want to win the game just naturally. There's nothing at stake other than- It's mind boggling. Product. I'm thinking if my nine-year-old understood mental models right now and how, because she's like our most street smart kid. You know, like our oldest is our responsible, 
He's very, you know, mental acuity, very sharp. Our second, she's our artist. She's like dancing and singing and misspelling, <laughs> right? All at the same time. And then our, our youngest is like our street smart kid. Like, you know what I mean? She's like, she's going to be the one to run a company someday for sure. And she's, you know, she's short and, uh, she, <laughs> yes, but, but yeah, great. like imagine like you start giving her skills, like mental models and, uh, economics and things like that, that, that could be, uh, that could be a pretty dangerous in a good way thing. I, I think so. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think there's this mostly what you do in life is you, you get paid on like specific knowledge, right? You go, yep. you, you go, for example, you find out, you know, how to run a podcast, what your audience, you know, about your audience yeah. in particular, right. And it's specific knowledge, but there's all this general knowledge that uh, that's, that's very helpful. That's what the mental models are. And yeah. they kind which of, which works no matter what you're doing, no yep. matter what you're doing. They, they help you understand situations you haven't seen before. They're repeated patterns, right? And so the idea is like that you can, you can learn all these things from a pretty young age, like really by about like 14, you should have every kid being familiar with all the big mental models. And that's something I think very, very few, like even 40 year olds are familiar with. So I think like what we're getting at is you can get at least the general education by the time you're 14, that's going to far surpass like, you know, anything that 99% of adults have in today's world. And I think that, you know, if we can get that to a large enough scale, the consequences of that could be, could be profound. No kidding. Absolutely. All right. Well, with that, with that in mind, um, I want to, want to hit two points. Number one. So synthesis school is now, or synthesis, the class is now available virtually and people can sign up to have their kids. Is there enrollment? Is it open to anyone? Like, how does it work now that you're trying to make it more available? Yeah, it's, it's, it's open to anyone. You know, our, our, kind of proximate goal as a company is just to take that class that we saw at, at, at Astra at SpaceX and make that available for everybody. Um, so if, if you, you know, we're, we're part of that is like getting the price down, just making it more accessible to people in different geographies and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, so far we've got it down from like, you know, be a billionaire and own your own rocket company to it's $180 <laughs> a month. It's a pretty big um, jump, right? Yeah. So that's a good jump. And we still, you know, that's still out of reach for a lot of people. And, yeah. uh, you know, we, totally understand that uh, we're kind of doing like the, you know, the Tesla like roadster strategy. It's, it's, it's a high price. It's very high touch. We've got like a lot of human involvement. We're really trying to make sure we take care of the families who are involved right now. But as we go, we'll, we'll keep uh, driving that down further. And can um, but it's anybody now, you know, any, anybody in so far as you can afford the 180 a month. Is there uh, like an enrollment period or is it can sign up anytime? You can like sign up anytime start? and yeah, you can sign up anytime and we, um, there is like a bit of an, an admissions process right now. So it, it's just, we're you know trying to eventually like anybody will be able to just like sign up and at least start like at the, they'll, there'll be levels to this, right? So the analogy I use is like Ender's Game. If you, have you read Ender's Game? No, but I know the premise. Okay. So yeah. The explain it, like, explain it. Give us a summary. Yeah. So Ender's Game is this uh, science fiction novel where the society is preparing for an, an alien invasion and they've right, got they some have advanced time warning it. right what's that and they have advanced, advanced warning. warning it's coming so what are we going to do about this yeah right. because it takes a while to travel across space they know it's coming and they set up an academy to train the kids to basically become you know the best possible starship commandos and the way they do it is they they put the kids on teams and they have them compete in basically war games and there's like a you know it starts off at like a low low level, your competition's not that fierce and the games aren't that complex. And when you master that, you move up stiffer competition, more complex games, right? It was, so that's like our metaphor for like what we're, what we're doing with synthesis, at least like where we're going to go, go with it. Right. And so we want to have it where anybody can join the bottom level, because you know, I think it's valuable for any kid, even if you're, if you're not going to, you know, go on to like run a company or, or, or you be an innovator, it's yeah. valuable for anybody in so far as the thinking skills and also it's fun. Um, so that, that's kind of the goal is like, make that like as low cost as possible for anybody. And then, you know, there'll be levels as you move up, um, as you get more advanced, then it will be, you know, uh, maybe more, more exclusive. Um, and it's just the same, like, as how like martial arts works, right? Like you can, anybody can go take a jujitsu class, but you know, you don't get to, you know, you don't get a black belt unless you put in the work. And I think yep. that's, that's basically what we're going with the synthesis. We want to make something that is accessible to anybody. And then for the kids who want to put in the work you know, just no speed limit, right? Let them go as fast right. as they, as they possibly can. And let them, this is important, be able to um, compete and collaborate with other kids who feel the same, right. From all over the world. Right. And um, 
you know, I think that there's something very powerful in, in that. Like we have students from, they're from rural Canada or they're from rural areas in the U S and then we have people who are like in the major cities as well. And they're getting, you know, we're able to like put them together and build this kind of like peer network at a young age where you can find people who match your ambition and like, uh, you know, intelligence and, and that sort of and interest and that sort of thing. That's a really valuable thing that a lot of people overlook because most kids go to school in a bubble not only in like an education bubble, but in a community bubble, in a cultural bubble. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be able to travel in what I do with clients across the country and in the automotive industry a lot. So it's, it's a, you know, a national, a national business. And I try to bring my kids with me as much as possible because I grew up in a very, I grew up, started in Philadelphia, moved across the bridge to South Jersey. But even so, my parents weren't entrepreneurs. We didn't travel um, so I had a very myopic view of the world. And as I started to learn and grow and went to school and started a business, I realized that every experience I had and every type of person I met, the world just got a little bit smaller. The world got a little bit smaller. The world got a little bit smaller. So to give kids that right from their own home, like through this class of common, common goals and this, this gamification and, you know, run by some of the brightest minds um, on the planet, really, I think is one of the like the intangible gifts that you just can never ever teach. Well, here's the textbook and here's what people are like from whatever country or whatever city, urban area or rural area. Can you imagine just trying to explain, well, these are rural kids. So they have farms near them. You know, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, totally. I mean, it's one of the, one of the big things that the kids love about it is, you know, they show up to a cohort and there's, there are accents from all over the world. There's all these different accents, right. And people from all these different places. And, uh, so they're getting, getting to make these connections, which is, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing. And it's, you know, it's just one of the benefits as this is going to be the, the biggest benefit, I think, as, as, as education moves more and more online, is that I, mean, I think your kids are going to have like their local friends that they do things in person with, and they're going to have their internet friends and yeah. that are aligned with their interests. And uh, I think that's, that's going to be, that's going to be very powerful. Kind of our, our like take on that is like, I think the the lever, you know, to most change the world is getting these kids together who are potentially interested in creating new technologies or or innovating and who kind of have the ambition to like make a ding in the universe, we say. Mm -hmm. Getting them connected with other people who are like them at a young age, I think is going to has the potential to like radically accelerate the innovation in society. So I always yeah. talk about like I want I want like a flying car and I want nuclear fusion. Right. And I, I want to like end factory farming and still have an, enough food for people to eat. And right. all that, all those things just require a lot of innovation. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we need, we need a generation of kids who's like trained to think that way, trained to right. like understand how things work. And then, people aren't going to cut it. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's great. You know, everything that Elon is doing is great, but you know, it'd be, it'd be better if we had like a million Elons. And, Imagine. You know, the I don't think, no, I don't know if the world would be I don't know if the world would survive with a million Elons. <laughs> <laughs> Some, something more than what we have now. Let's, uh, let's, yeah, we'll see. I suppose it's possible to push it too far, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I always think it's like there's there's an unlimited, you know, we, we I feel like we can make things better in unlimited ways. And there's, there's so much opportunity to improve the world. Yeah. I, mean, I just, you know, there should be an education that trains kids to see things that way gives them the understanding so they can understand how things work and the confidence to know that they can understand how, how systems work and, and also encourages them to have the imagination to imagine mm -hmm. things could be different. And I think if you have those two things, then. Yeah. Well, let's just imagine, imagine the marketability, just think from an economic standpoint or in the workforce standpoint, the marketability of someone who comes to a certain position or a certain company with this type of ability to think and some framework by which to communicate that ability to think, right? It's not a college degree. It's not, you know, a, not a resume or not a grade, but more or less, and I don't even know what that would look like right now. I mean, obviously things that you've done from a resume standpoint would speak to what you're capable of, but yeah. imagine people hiring based on that and what that would do for any type of company. Like you yeah. said, like that ability, it's not just technology, um, it, but it's technology, agriculture, justice, um, manufacturing, just across the board, even religion, right? Getting all of those things could be changed by someone who is thinking holistically. Like I wasn't expecting you to say the, the you gave the synthesis example. He's like, okay, so we're buying art 
and we're going on a tour across the and we're selling access to the art and we're at auctions. I'm like, that's not what I was expecting. I was expecting like, okay, like more more like the, the, the plot of there's aliens coming and we need to defend ourselves. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> the thing is all the games are different, right? So there's, there's uh, there'll always be new ones coming on board and, you know, it's um, really you're just trying to create something that has the complexity to keep the kids interested and, and yep. you're just trying to create, it's, it's the maze thing. Like you said, like we're trying to create a maze that takes you, you know, a couple weeks or a couple months to solve. And it's like, is is fun and engaging. And also with the mental models thing, it's like we're connecting it to knowledge as well. Right. Like when the kids play the art game, the parents are all emailing us now. Like my kid got really interested in, uh, in the impressionist period. Are there any books you can recommend? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, they're just so surprised that their kid wants to read about art, but art. it's, I think that just the way people are like kids don't really need any prompt to be curious. They naturally want to figure out the world. I think what we do in school basically turns them off of that, but that natural kind of desire to learn things that are going to be helpful is there. And, you know, what synthesis does is just, it creates like a playground and environment gives you, gives you an excuse to acquire knowledge. And uh, you know, we see kids taking to that. So let's talk about uh, kind of the last thing, maybe, we're in a, in a time of major disruption in the education system. I mean, we've already known the college system is falling apart. Um, it's an unsustainable financial model. Um, it's it's a, a very overstated value proposition from 20 years ago when you had to get a college degree to have any value in the marketplace. We know that that mm -hmm. is not the case unless it's a very specific thing. Like, I want to be a doctor. Okay, or like, I want I want my doctor to go through this specific course. But in business economics, education, like there's so many things where like the degree doesn't do it, that the price and the value of the ROI is different. Now we've hit the pandemic. Um, everything is about to get tipped and pushed over the edge. We have elementary school kids all the way through learning on Zoom, um, doing, it's, it seems like we're at a real fragile tipping point of, of coming apart from a, like a traditional standpoint. And like, you know, people like Seth Godin, Seth Godin would say, well, the education system was fine, when we were trying to spit out units of production and put them in our factories to work and produce. Like that's what this education system was actually designed for was to spit out bots that we could then put into the industrial world and make stuff, but we're not there anymore. Now it's something different. What yeah. do you, here's, and here's the question. So in all that, I'll just set it up. That's where we are. What do you think the real opportunity is in an education system that's so established that has unions and big pots of money that have to be spent colleges that have these big you know big conglomerate like donors and all that what do you think is a is going to like really have us in a mass way even start to to think differently it's a big question yeah yeah that's a really big question i think i, I sort of think education is just a special case of what you're seeing going on in basically all the 20th century institutions which is they're all just bleeding trust and credibility all of them and you see this you know probably primarily in the in the political system and you see it in the media um but it's come to colleges as you mentioned as well like that whole system that people relied on like okay we can we can rely on this system being there we'll get our kids to get good grades in high school or encourage that and then they'll go to college and things will be okay people have lost trust in that mm -hmm. and COVID is kind of accelerating this, but I, I think it's just part of, uh, this is going on before COVID. Oh, there's, actually, sure. uh, there's a former CIA analyst, Martin Gurry, who wrote a book called Revolt of the Public that kind of goes over this from like the political standpoint. And that's that his conclusion is what I just said is like, there's, these institutions are basically like bleeding trust. And, uh, and that's why you kind of have like a lot of the, um, a lot of what's going on now, now politically and with the media and that sort of thing. And I think that's just come to education. And, uh, you know, I, I think what's going to happen is the same thing that's happened with media, right? There's basically like a mass exit. I mean, the New York Times still has subscribers and readers, but people are flocking to, you know, uh, podcasts like yours. Like it, it's all kind of fragmenting yeah. and people are finding other, yeah. yeah, it's decentralizing and people are finding other ways to get that trust. And so I think that's what's going to happen in education. I think the local, you know, the, this 20th century system is just, it's just going to continue bleeding trust and you know first order effect is like parents are going to start looking for things like synthesis mm -hmm. and, uh, and and you know there are going to be a bunch of companies that come up that fill that need and uh you know i i would hope that there's going to be some voice in this system because you know public education providing daycare and like local community and that kind of thing that's still 
going to be good. Be solved. At, yeah, absolutely. That. But, you know, it, that's going to be parents are going to have to get more involved and like have a voice there and not not leave it up to, uh, you know, the authorities and the school boards that have been running things kind of into the ground. Uh, those, you know, it, it might just it might be like science where, you know, science, there's the saying is science advances uh, one funeral at a time. And it just might be. The same. <laughs> I mean, I've never heard that these school board members to have to retire um, and get get some fresh blood in there. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how long that's going to take. Uh, it's probably it's going to be pretty ugly. But I know for sure those institutions losing trust creates huge opportunities for you know people like you, like creating a podcast. Anyone who's trying to do something new, it's like it's it's a golden age, right? Because all these yeah. things that like run the world are are collapsing. And well, uh, it's you know, just like effects, but it's yeah. just like you know it happens in commerce first. Any any industry that technology touches, it just makes it incredibly efficient, right? It takes out all the middlemen, all the gatekeepers. And when technology, for instance, when technology hit automotive, all of a sudden, everybody knew everything about the car. They knew what dealers were buying the car for. They knew right. what everybody else was paying for the car. So all of a sudden the market became very efficient. Prices came down and you know, consumer understanding came up and now we have a very efficient market. There's hardly any profit in the system. So people have to get creative how to make profit. Maybe the same thing happens with education. We've now been thrust forward into something that was already rattling. And now technology has come into the market. We have the ability to connect with one another. We have like now widely accepted tools like Zoom and that, that it's now the state has signed off and said, this is a viable way to educate your children. They never yep. would have said that before. Yeah, that's that like can't be it's like hard to overstate how important that is like i, I started an online tutoring company like 10 years ago mm -hmm. um and it was just you couldn't it worked the technology was fine back then but it didn't you couldn't convince parents now yeah. it's just now online learning is just like oh okay like i people are you know i think i think there's obviously like in person is uh can't be only online right like no, you could I, get I the education it, it doesn't it doesn't need to be like a, but i my hope is I wrote an essay about this. My, my hope is that the local schools kind of give up doing what they've been doing and start to say like, well, okay, kids can learn to read. They can do math. They can do things like synthesis online. They can learn any kind of facts online or learn any, you know, any topic that, that is like, you know, purely cognitive. What are we going to do now? Right. We should be more focused on letting the kids play, like, let, you know, letting them uh, do hands-on projects, uh, you know, develop friendships, develop relationships with local adults who care about them and are oh going to be goodness. in their lives for, for years. Well, the whole skill set of teachers now is going to change. It's from true. someone that can actually just make sure someone recites their facts to someone who's now far more observant about what what's going on dynamically in an environment and like being able to, I mean, that that's always the challenge when a bunch of people are together, right? You have to teach to the back of the class. And mm -hmm. when you're, when that's you're right. teaching facts, right? I'm teaching members at math, you know, arithmetic, I'm teaching, you know, times tables, I have to teach slow enough so that everybody can get it when yeah, chances are half of the class can get it in half of the time. But there's an impossible job. It's very, oh, yeah. I mean, it's, like, I, listen, I listen to my son doing his zoom classes. And he's in he's in like a local school. And it's, I'm, you know, I'm just like, I, I don't know, I don't know if I feel worse for the kids or for the teacher, because you can tell the teacher like they don't want to be teaching these kids grammar like in a group like this, this is very difficult on a, on a zoom call yeah and it's yeah, yeah it's, it's brutal it's hard. yeah anyway <laughs> it's brutal well Christman, i can't like my mind's racing as a as a homeschool parent so it's really in, engaging like i'm gonna go home and talk to my wife and be like we need to we need to check this out uh, we are going to check it out i'm gonna link it up in the notes um the website is synthesis.is and uh, also, you know, you you have some really great thoughts that you're constantly putting to the world on Twitter, and you said you write essays. What's the best way for people to stay connected with you and your trajectory? Ah, yeah, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm at Chrisman Frank on Twitter. Is probably the best way, and I have a. I just started a blog, ChrismanFrank.com. Um, just share share some of these uh, off the wall thoughts on education. So I'll be putting out more there as well. I love it. Well, I'll be following along. You have a new follower. I'm going to be paying attention uh -huh. to what you're saying. Uh, thank you so much for giving some of your time to us today. And uh, pleasure, hey, yeah, it's a lot of fun. 20 years from now, may we have a generation of kids who can think broadly and, you know, because someday they're going to be the ones that take care of us. So that, that's the plan. Yeah. Well, thanks, Paul. My pleasure. Talk to yes. you soon. Okay. Anyone who has kids who's who's signing up for the class, like he said in there, there's uh, the first like two or three classes are free. You can it's no obligation. So I'm going to go sign all my kids up just frankly, because I want them to be competitive in the market against 
all of your kids. So, and hopefully they'll work together and they'll take care of us when we get old and we can't move anymore. That's, I'm, it's a joke I say to my kids and it's probably true, unfortunately, but I said, I changed your diapers and one day you'll change mine. I hope our kids figure out an issue so we that is not an issue any longer. So I encourage you to go to the site synthesis.is. Follow Crispin. Go to crispinfrank.com. He's got a blog and he's got a, a lot of good involvement in social media because, look, let's just be honest. We all want to get a little bit closer to Elon Musk and his way of thinking because there's definitely something there. I think we can agree. That being said, thank you for spending some time with us today, uh, spending some time with me today. I know you have a lot of options, a lot of opportunities. I hope you learn a little bit. And even if you don't have kids, I hope you start thinking a little bit more holistically about how we can approach the challenges with a little bit more clarity, a little bit more perspective on the world that we're living in and the world that we are trying to grow and cultivate together. I will see you next week. You just got a love song. You just got a